Hello. The title of this talk is making a fast website because I couldn't think of a better title, but we'll we'll do it next time. So what ended up happening is that a couple of we no, like a month and a something ago, we had a nice discussion on Flowdoc on basically website performance, and folks were wondering, hey, like you seem to have posted a lot of links and text. Can we get this in a different format? So now it's a talk. There's so much to do in web performance, but I'm going to give you one very practical and very appropriately meta example of Tech Weekly. So this is a Tech Weekly talk about making the Tech Weekly site faster uh, or fast, because that was the first iteration that of the new site. Uh, but anyway, to give you some motivation, I'm going to show you a chart not from the weekly site, but from production, which I'm very proud of. This is the first meaningful paint on FIBA3x3.com uh, on the team I work at. You can see that at the mid-October or end of October, the first paint was at six seconds. And doing literally just the optimizations I'll show you today, I think currently it's at like three. And if you look at the sort of slope, it's at two seconds, which is an improvement of like, I don't know, whatever percent, but four seconds down, basically, or three and something seconds down. So that's very exciting. Um, now, what do I mean when I'm saying like some practical examples for web performance? The way the browser loads things uh, is really good if you want to make a generic browser that you can throw any sort of markup and it will do the right thing. So it's, it's optimized for correctness. Uh, it is not necessarily optimized for speed uh, in, for many websites, which is not to say that they're doing something wrong. In fact, like props to them that you can take any arbitrary like HTML and throw it and it gets rendered. That's kind of amazing. Um, so consider sort of the vanilla example that you can have. You have like a HTML. I might zoom in a little bit more. Sorry for the lack of highlighting. I still haven't figured that out. But imagine you have a link rel style sheet, um, some classes that set fonts on your page, uh, and a script at the end. Very like basic way of adding things. Um, this thing has a number of issues as far as getting things to paint fast on the page. This was like the simplest way I could get it. This was the simplest way I, I could get it. So the browser first gets the HTML. It starts parsing the HTML. If it finds CSS in the head, it stops the world, goes to the network, gets the CSS, parses the CSS, sees how things match, and then it goes on with its life. If it, while it keeps parsing the DOM, having the CSS, it discovers that the font is being used. Guess what? It stops, goes to the network, looks for the font, uh, it doesn't stop the parsing necessarily, but what it does is that it doesn't show your text. So your text is there in principle, but it's invisible for three seconds or up to three seconds until it gets the font. If those three seconds pass and it still doesn't have the font, it shows the fallback font. Uh, and whenever it comes back, if it ever comes back, it replaces it. And finally, the scripts. If you have the script in this way, just like just at the end of the body, which is a good idea generally, without any sort of async or defer attributes, then it also sort of blocks the execute and you know has to parse, execute, and so on. It doesn't matter because at the end it's at the end of the body, which is kind of where this convention came from. But there are things you can do better there. And it sort of repeats this whole process until it finishes. All of this, if it does, if it sounds slow, A, it's because I made it sound slow, and B, it probably kind of is. If you want to know a little bit more properly how this works, there's a nice article by Ben Schwartz, I think, on CSS tricks called the critical request that kind of explains how those things work. And in general, what I want to get at today is that sort of 20% of the optimizations that you can do are really damn good in terms of like some of the metrics. So you don't need to know everything. But you know, knowing some, having some tricks in your tool belt helps a lot. It also helps because you know what to try necessarily, even if that doesn't mean that it will improve things. Some metrics, there are so many metrics. Metrics for days. And you know you need to measure something. Otherwise, how do you know if it's fast or slow? Like I've said the words fast and slow like 20 times already. And what does it even mean? Uh, these are some common ones. First paint is the first paint that's not like white background on the page. First meaningful paint is a little bit harder to define. Basically, most of the content on your page is painted. This might differ depending on your product. Speed index is also kind of annoying to define. Imagine it's a number that correlates with how quickly stuff on your page becomes visible. So if you were to graph um, visual completion on one axis and time on the other axis, and you take the area above that graph, that's speed index. But anyway, what you need to know is that like low speed index, good. Big speed index, bad, good. Time to interactive, again, basically means what is the time when somebody can meaningfully interact with your page. That is also sometimes being defined in more or less. Uh, these days, it's defined in terms of latency, I think. Like if you tap on something and it takes 
two seconds for the browser to do something that's probably not really interactive, right? Like a slideshow or something. Uh, first painted hero, last painted hero, loads of things. And custom metrics as well. Like Twitter famously has had time to first tweet as something they optimize. Pinterest has like time to first pin. Uh, I guess that's how it works. Um, time to first headline, I don't know, in news websites probably. If you want more on this, there's 40 minutes of it, a really nice talk by Tammy Everts on performance.now where she explains kind of what all of these things mean and sort of why none of this is really perfect, but you have to pick something. Well, you don't have to, but you know. So let's measure our site. So this, if you, if you keep one thing through this whole presentation, that link is what you want, webpagetest.org. It's amazing. It's really good. You just throw a URL and it gives you graphs. It gives you numbers. It has all the things. And consider the, the easy thing. Uh, easy does not mean it's easy. It actually should be called slash hard, realistically, because uh, it uses slow 3G and a median mobile device, AKA not Finland 4G on our like 1,000 euro iPhones. Uh, it's really good. And we're going to look at it now, I think. Yes. The way I have done this is I have a repository where I did optimizations as pull requests. And every pull request is deployed to a different like, set, like staging environment. So we can actually measure things. That's there. This is the site without any optimizations. You're not going to notice it being slow, because again, like I'm on futurized Wi-Fi in Finland. So OK, I guess that was slow. Uh, but, but that's why you need to measure, actually, in something more realistic. And that's what we have here. I've already run the test, because it might take like a few minutes. Let me try zooming in real quick. Let's see if that works. Cool. Um, that number means nothing. I don't know why they saw the PWA score for a generic website. That seems a bit like Chrome pushing its agenda. Anyhow, um, and you know the numbers are like, hey, 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 we're doing great. But if you look at the actual metrics, it's we're not doing that well. So start render. Actually, no, we are doing okay because the site is very small, right? Like the CSS is like 10k and the HTML is like 5k. Like you have to try a lot to make that slow. But you will see that even in this site, the optimizations help a lot. And it really scales with the size of your CSS, for instance, or your HTML. So start the render is at four seconds. So first byte, you'll see it means two seconds. It means the moment it gets a response from the server is at two seconds. We have done HTTPS handshakes, any kind of content negotiations, the server has woken up or whatnot, and it has given us two seconds. So that's the earliest we could feasibly paint, right, as soon as we have data. You'll see that, that we only start rendering things at four seconds. And the reason that happens is because of the CSS and the fonts and th those things that I told you. You'll see speed index says 5.565. It doesn't mean much, but just see that number go down and you'll know it's fine. Also, speed index is not seconds technically, but I don't know. First interactive as well, nine seconds. You can also see a timeline view, which I really like. You just click on it and hopefully it works. Very briefly, the green line means we have started rendering. This is the thing that we're going to try to optimize in this site because it's very content heavy. We don't really have any heavy, I don't know, backflips with JavaScript or whatnot, so it's fine. And you'll see like the blue is the HTML and that green over there is the CSS. So like blue comes in, the entire green has to come in and then we render in. You see the thing. So that's the blocking behavior right there. Uh, you'll also see that the font files load afterwards, like those two font files, uh, after the CSS has come in because you need the CSS to start going to the network and fetching the, the font files. And you'll see this log tail of JS that I'm going to touch on later. If you look a bit down there, you'll see that red at the right. That means that no matter what they, we do, the browser, the, or the browser is blocked, basically, and the user cannot interact with their page. And that's because all of that JS is executing. That's more to this thing. But you can play around and go to the link and, and see it in practice. Point being, Good, but let's improve that. So we need a sort of plan. The plan here is to optimize the critical path, because that's the topic of the presentation. Uh, we're going to be optimizing the first meaningful paint. Ideally, I want, as soon as we have data, I want this thing to render. And any sort of outlier in interactivity is something I want to handle. This will, of course, vary by your side. But I think prioritizing the first paint is always a sort of good idea, because it's something you can get for free uh, in many respects. So we'll be handling the critical CSS, the font loading, and the JS size. So the first technique that we're going to try is uh, called CSS inlining. Remember that whole thing I told you about the CSS and blocking and going to the browser and so on, or the, the network, sorry. Um, what if we would just inline <laughs> the critical CSS? Critical CSS is a little bit ill-defined. It's basically the CSS you use on your page. If you can take that and put it in a style tag, you don't need to go to the network. You can load the, the rest async. Depending on the side of your site, you can try to be more clever and only pick the CSS that's in the viewport. 
in my experience, the critical CSS is never too large. Like CSS tends to grow with the size of the site, but the CSS for a single page doesn't change that much, I think. I find it pretty okay in most things I've done to just inline the thing for the page. The way you do that, if you want to see the exact nitty gritty details, go to the PR pages afterwards. The way you do that basically is link rel preload means stop, block the world, go do the thing. If you use link rel, sorry, link rel style sheet. If you use link rel preload, uh, the preload is widely supported in all modern browsers these days. It basically says go and get this resource, but don't worry about executing it. Don't worry about blocking the browser. Don't worry about any of that. I got it covered. Uh, which is really good. It's actually a super important primitive that has been lacking for a long time from the web platform. It basically decouples the downloading from the execution, and you can use it for CSS files, for JS, we'll do it afterwards for fonts, all that stuff. And the other cool thing it does is, remember how the browser has to parse the HTML before it does things? Something that the browsers do is they have a look-ahead parser where they try to find hints at what are important things for the page. So for example, the CSS is important for the page. And if you use the preload tag, it's a very clear sign to the browser when it is parsing that you're going to use that resource. So actually, it also changes the priority. And that's kind of why it's called preload. So basically, what you do is you set it as preload. And once it loads, you swap things in, because you have already inlined the critical, sorry, the styles. You can also see it in the browser, actually. Probably it's going to be horrible, and you're not going to see it. But let's see. Yes, you see this style tag, this sneaky style tag is what we have done with our inlining script. The inlining script is in the PR, it's open source, you can find it. It basically looks for things with that CSS name, finds the selectors, it's not very interesting in the implementation. But anyway, there's our CSS. Like, if you want to be convinced, I can go and delete the style sheet and nothing changes because the styles are there. Let's put that back. And basically, the style sheet then, it's preloaded and once it loads, it swaps it as a style sheet. So we're saying, you know, not going to use it, not going to use it. OK, now use it. Because that doesn't block the browser, because it's already downloaded by the point that you come to add it to the DOM. Results. Let's see what the numbers tell us. Ah, we have done better. Start render is at 3.2. We have saved 700 milliseconds here. Speed index has also gone down, which is good, as we know. Um, in general, like from 3.9 to 3.2, it's a decent saving. The CSS is tiny. The CSS is 10K. Now imagine a site where the CSS is more realistically 60K, and you're looking at one and a half seconds of savings. Like on the feedback.com site that I showed you, I think we saved like 1.5 something seconds just by inlining the critical CSS. Something that, especially if you have a static site, you can do it very easily, but you can also do it in dynamic sites. So that's my favorite thing. That's literally my first, my, my favorite party trick is inlining critical CSS. Now, OK, we have that down. Let's handle the font loading. So the font loading, again, is a little bit annoying because your content is there and the user is not seeing it. Like, it just, on principle, it annoys me so much. Like, I, you've done all this hard work to get it to the page. And then the browser's like, eh, three seconds, I guess I'll chill now. Yeah, not very nice. Not only that, it's not just the performance, though, as I'm outlining here. Your site also has a correctness problem if you do that. Because if you have different font files and you have a bold file and a regular file, and the bold file fails to load, suddenly you have the so-called Mitt Romney problem, which means that Slate.com some years ago was running a headline saying, Mitt Romney is not running for president. Not was in italics and bold for emphasis. You see where this is going? So that font failed to load, and suddenly Mitt Romney was running for president in the headline. I couldn't care less about it, but I do care about the possibility of a bug. Like, this can happen in your application. And that sort of goes into the mentality that I really like, that it's never just about performance, right? Like, this optimizes performance, but it also optimizes, you know, weird edge case bugs. I don't have a news website, but I mean, it's good to have that. And also, if fonts come and go as they please, uh, the browser layouts every single time. Every single time a new font is added to the, to the display, it just paints again. So you have this annoying behavior where you open a page and, like, Things pop up around like five times before the page settles, and like you're hopefully maybe still on the page. Who knows? There's nothing by default that handles that, and okay, that's kind of to be expected. There is one thing though these days, again supported in modern browsers, it's this property called font display swap. You add it to the font face rules, and basically it says, hey browser, you know that default behavior you do where you block? Yeah, don't do it, please. 
Um, and it doesn't. It paints immediately. That's what Font Display Swap does. So that kind of handles that problem, the problem of basically waiting three seconds with invisible text. Then you still have the problem that you need to load your fonts earlier before the CSS has to come in and parse and blah, blah, blah. Our good friend Linkrel Preload also handles that because it says right from the beginning, you're going to need this. Believe me, just load it. And when it does need it, it's there. Um, and also, I'm doing something very minimal here. I'm using a variable font on the website uh, in the optimized version. A variable font basically means that it has all the font weights, from regular to light to bold in a single file, which means that if you load that file, you only relay out once, because it's just that one file that has to come in. And suddenly, the bolds, the italics, all of them, they rely on one thing. Uh, so either they all fail together, or they all work together. One important thing there is that the, the file has to be small. So in our case, it's 26K, which is about the size of one regular file, uh, font file. Uh, Usually, variable fonts are very large. They're like 100 and something K. So you need different strategies there. And also, you're probably not using variable. Who uses variable fonts in production? Cool. Yes, exactly. So there's other strategies. But I went with a minimal one because you know I was making this site for our weeklies. Zach Leatherman is the absolute MVP on these things. They, they have so many, like 40 articles, I think, on font loading. Knock yourselves out if you want. Uh, I like th that presentation of his uh, at Performance Now, where they, he goes sort of very modern approaches to doing this, because there's like 20 different ways to do it, goes over like three or four good ones. It's not something that's, like once you know it, it's fine, it makes sense, but it's something that you should document, and it's a little bit of complexity to maintain. That's why it's not my favorite optimization, but if you document it well, I think it's a really good addition to have in your site. Let's look at the numbers, though, because I can be telling you all these good things and the numbers might be wrong. 2.8, we're doing like 400 milliseconds earlier now. Uh, that could be just a fluke. Like, the speed index is more important because the speed index actually cares about the shift in content. The render doesn't, it doesn't get affected, really, if the fonts load or not. What really, though, would convince us is to actually look, first of all, at the timeline, which you will see there is only one font file being loaded, and this font file is being loaded from the beginning before any kind of, alongside the CSS. If you see how it's parallel to the green, that means that it doesn't need the CSS to start loading. Something that else that might convince us is the film strip view, where presumably, it's not easy to see here, but anyway, things only relay out once. Um, not very easy to see, and I don't have much time, so I'm going to move on. So we've handled those two things now, and now we're moving to the third part, JS. So if we look at the trace again, whatever it is, uh, honestly, with several trace, you'll see this long ass line of JS, like those 20 seconds of JavaScript chilling. I mean, it doesn't matter for the page, but on principle, it's annoying. And also, if you look at the, um, if you look at the byte scene, we're like 700 kilobytes to just show a page, that seems like huge to me. And I know that our JS is not that big, because I wrote our JS and it's like 5K. So what, what is happening there? Like, our JS is very small, like, what? Why? And the answer is YouTube iframes. 600K of JS <laughs> on load. Yeah, not very nice. Um, you can actually notice it on the side. It's basically like this thing. The user might never click this thing as far as they're concerned, but we're, they're paying that cost. And I mean that literally, you know, like in places with limited bandwidth, they might literally be paying that cost. Uh, not that you ever metaphorically pay the cost, but you know what I mean. So let's handle this YouTube. Can we like just fake the YouTube video thing? And the answer is yes, we can. This is the optimized version. This is the iframe version. This is a fake. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I literally just went and did some templating things. Um, I don't know if I'm violating some copyrights or something. Uh, I did not use exactly that interface. It's just a static thing that's made to look like a YouTube video. One cool thing I like about it, apart from the performance, look what happens with the tab focus. Um, suppose I'm at the beginning, and then I'm tabbing through. Title, title in the iframe, you can't even see that. And now, what is focused? The button is focused, but YouTube's focus styles suck. If I press Enter, oh, I was not on the button, sorry. Maybe now I'm on the button? No, I was on something else. Exactly. Um, so not only are we doing better in performance, we're doing even better in accessibility by keeping a nice focus style on our button. Because we're in control of what gets rendered now. So 
my favorite optimization on the side was this thing because it was like super ad hoc and like yeah, it's great. There's also a little bit of JS at runtime to take those properties and swap it in. I'm literally you can find if you have a video ID, you can find the images, the the thumbnail previews. Sometimes it breaks actually, and we have to manually update the thumbnail on YouTube, but it's fine. Yes, uh, but it's it's that, and it took like you know, half an hour of my time, not, not a huge amount of time anyway. And honestly, I really like this optimization. And what I like this optimization not just from a, I have more details there basically, but I like this optimization not just from a performance standpoint, but I like it from a UX standpoint, right? Like, because we're literally asking, okay, 700K of JS, does, does the user need that to access our site? Not really. And then it's more interesting questions. Why does the user go on our site? And for me, or when I made the site, it was a very clear answer. We have really nice talks every week here. We have really cool people. I want this to be discoverable by others. Whether they end up playing the YouTube video on our page doesn't really matter to me. It's like we can have the thumbnail to be enticing and give them the convenience. But what was really important for me is that we can list these items and like who's talking and when are they talking and so on and so forth. Like, you know, to be able to do this stupid animation here or something, hand-coded SVG animations, they're great. And another thing that I got to do with this when I was doing the fake YouTube frame, I guess we're calling it that, I also added this explicit link to the YouTube because they might have JavaScript off, they might not want to play the video in that moment, but they can, you know, right-click and save that link or they can, you know, long tap and save it to Pocket or whatnot. So actually, this change was a really good prompt to do something better for the UX and the accessibility of the website and not just the performance. But it was a really good you know, thing for performance as well. We're not loading, like if you look at the trace, like you can actually see the trace because there's not 20 seconds of JS after it. Like you can read it now. That's, that's much nicer. Um, and I think that's the sort of idea that I will try to leave you with. Like, what is the user in your site for? Like I've shown you three techniques that I think are good. There are 20 more out there. If you dig into the like pull requests I have there, it might take you a couple of hours to go through them. But And they're useful to have. They're useful to know. But I think that if you're asking that question more, I'm sure your users are going to be in good hands. That has been my talk. If you have any more questions, either now or later, I would be happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much. So questions? question in the, the metrics between the optimizations the, the like interactive time or whatever it's called mm. was very different like it went from I think three seconds to nine seconds mm. and kind of like what's explaining that the first interactive yeah now it's 4.5 and then before I think the previous was over nine yeah and before that it was like something smaller yeah so it kind of depends also on when the JavaScript has come in. Like there is, some of this is flakiness in the me in the measuring actually. First interactive or time to interactive is very hard to measure like this. I think if you want to be realistic, I would do it with real user metrics on the field. Or um, you'll notice this is a different tool. This is Pitcurve. Their collection is a little bit more rigorous in that they do warm up runs and so on. Uh, or you, you should do it over you know many days and actually see it, especially measuring the latency. So yeah, it's a little bit, and especially in this case, right? The site is not, it's not that the site is an interactive before the YouTube has come in. Like it was more like optimizing the data usage there. Yeah. Can you please tell us what's the number sixty-five? Because no matter how much like you optimize, <laughs> yeah. it was stuck on sixty-five. Web page test is made by somebody at uh, Google, I believe. I don't. I'm not going to associate that necessarily with the reason why. But uh, Google has this tool called Lighthouse. Lighthouse also measures performance and accessibility. It also measures a progressive web app score, which measures whether you have a service worker registered to handle offline navigations or something like that. For some reason, they thought it's relevant to show me this number here. It's really not. So maybe there was a setting in the metrics. But yeah, that 65 is just there to vex me, actually, I think, because it's like red. Oh, no. Yeah, it's. I, I'm pretty sure there's a setting somewhere, but I didn't pay attention to it. Thanks. So if we would put this into like a large project, would there be overhead of maintaining all of this? Okay, hey, what is now the critical CSS? Or mm -hmm. like, hey, what JS should we load first? And what should we load later? And so on, like keeping track of everything and make sure it works? 
Yeah, so there is definitely that sort of the unspoken rule here, and you're right that uh, documenting things is important. So the the critical CSS, I think you can automate to a really good extent. Um, okay. Like plugging my own thing, I have. If you look <laughs> at the PRs, there is something that automates it in ah. a simple way. You have to be a bit careful with CSS because the uh, the source order matters. So you need to be to know when things get loaded because mm. if you load things differently, uh, and that's actually why a lot of Modern tools around CSS are so complex because they're trying to handle that. I think, especially for static sites, it's super uh, predictable. Like fiba 3 xcom like look at this beauty. Like it it happens statically, so you can do it with very high confidence. The font loading is something you should definitely document. And even in weeklies and in calm, I have comments and sort of a document that says, "Here's how you do it." It's something that you set up and you kind of forget about it. It's just <laughs> important that you know. It's not that it's going to break all of a sudden, but when the next person comes around to maintain it, they should know about it. Uh, cool. The custom YouTube frame, I, do, I mean, it's fine, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. That's so domain specific that I'm sure that it will be in your component library somewhere. Sure. All right. Thank you for this. Please give us a. Yeah.